introduction of Professor Ferdman. Most of you know him. He's our professor in the organizational psychology program in San Diego. And he's teaching cultural diversity in uh, organizations, the same course that most of you are in right now. For He's been teaching that course for a long time. He's also a consultant, um, especially in the area of diversity and inclusion, which is going to be the topic of his talk today. He mainly works with Latino and Latino <coughs> communities and internationally, actually, he works internationally. He's going to tell about himself more, and I want to introduce this new book that he just published, the same name as, um, uh, as his talk, uh, Diversity at Work, The Practice of Inclusion. And I'm hoping, I can't wait to read it and, and adopt it for my course for next year. Um, and hopefully we'll be uh, copying some pages for this, this semester as well. So with that, I leave the stage to Dr. Ferdman. Um, um, it's great to be here. Thank you all for, for coming. I guess one, one key to success is having things in a small room, and that way it feels like it's really packed, right? So thanks for bearing with us on that. And uh, it feels nice and warm to be here in, in LA campus. We don't do that enough, and so I'm really thankful to, to Nershan and to uh, Patricia and, and Jonathan for hosting and, and all the folks who make this happen. Uh, and thanks to the Student Government Association. It's, it's great to share in one's own organization. As, uh, as, uh, am, I, am I allowed to call you Nershan here? I see you all do doctor this and doctor yes. that. But we do the same thing there, and I rebel against it all the time. Yes, please. <laughs> I remember when I was a first year grad student, I went up to my advisor, uh, we were talking about this with my fellow students, when do you start calling people, you know, Bob or Irving or whatever, and I said, well, you kind of figure it out, and so just immediately afterwards, I went up to Bob Abelson, who was my statistics teacher at the time, later was my uh, dissertation advisor, um, I went up to him in the mail room and I said, um, 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 what can I call you, um, and he said, well, I guess you can call me, he was very awkward, and he said, uh, I guess you can call me Bob, but you'll know when the time is right, and you'll know when that is. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, it's about the kind of cultures that we create on purpose or inadvertently. It's, that's just one piece of that, isn't it? Um, so sometimes you have to rebel whatever role you're in, if you think it's the right thing to do. Or not, but at least just be conscious about it and discuss it and see if you really want to do it that way and make a choice or not, right? So I think, in part, that's related to the things we're going to be talking about. Um, as um, Nershan said, I just published a book uh, with, a, with a number of other people. Um, this is the, uh, the list of, of authors and the sections of the book. It's part of the um, professional practice series of uh, SIOP, the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology. So uh, even though I don't get any royalties, I'm proud that it's in that series because it gives it a certain place in the literature that I'm happy where I'm happy to have it. And that was part of my goal, is to really be at the juncture of theory and research with practice and really kind of link the two. What's interesting about this field is that there's not that many I.O. psychologists who are experts in the practice of inclusion particularly, and maybe even about diversity more generally. Mark happens to be one of the few of them, but there's not that many, right? I mean, um, and it's a growing group, and some of you clearly are going to be part of that group. Um, but the, typically, the professional practice series are folks who are I.O. psychologists who then tell the rest of the people how to do things, right, based on I.O. psychology theories and principles and, and research. In this case, I thought it had to be a two-way kind of thing. So, in a sense, it's not just about the I.O. psychologists telling the rest of the world about diversity and inclusion. It's about the diversity and inclusion specialists also speaking to the um, I.O. psychologists. And that was very much a conscious part of my thinking as we thought about who the author should be. So it's really a mix of people, of, of academics and practitioners and everything in between, um, consultants and so on. And so it took me a long time, much longer than my dissertation. I first put the book proposal in in 2007. It was accepted around then and, you know, it took, uh, what, three, six years almost uh, and a lot of pressure getting up, making sure I got a co-editor to help me out. Uh, which I guess you can't do in a dissertation, unfortunately. But sometimes one wishes, right? Um, and, and we have different levels uh, for looking at inclusion. And I'll talk more about those, but I wanted to show you how what I'm talking about, in a sense, is the, the underlying framework for the book. And then the different chapters go into more detail on a lot of these pieces. And part of what I like about it, both in planning it, but especially in retrospect, is 
the idea of having many different voices speak to inclusion. Because it's a big umbrella, and you hear so many different definitions about diversity, about inclusion, what you should do about it, how we should do it, that, and they all have some sense. And so the question is, what, what's, gonna, what's right? And it, it, it's particularly confusing if you're looking for that expert position. I think for those of you who are students in particular, I think it's important that you realize you're going to have to develop your own, your own position on what this is. It should be an informed position. You shouldn't just make it up without knowing what others are saying or somehow being able to relate what you're saying to what they say. But it's still, you're going to have to interpret yourself and make that connection. And one of the things we try to do in this book is give voice to all those different perspectives. And so, in fact, in the first chapter, which is kind of an overview of the concept and the field, and I'll be talking about some of the ideas in there tonight, um, I have like a six-page table where I put quotes from many, many different uh, sources as to what inclusion is and what are some of its elements. And part of my goal there was to show, first of all, it's not a new, completely new concept. So people try to say, we just invented it like last month. Not really. Some of us have been working in that area for quite a few years. It's, and and um, there's different points of view about it, and we need to recognize those and structure them and understand how they fit together. And then you can go and work on your particular piece of it while knowing how it relates to everybody else's piece. And to me, that's pretty much what inclusion is about. How do we take all our differences, um, everything that makes us who we are, similarities as well, that's the diversity part, and how do we put it together in a way that works well for everybody and for the collective? Okay, we're done. Oh. Got that? <laughs> you want more? All right. So, um, so I'm passing around the book, but I just wanted to start out with that. Um, if you want to learn more about the, the table of contents, the names of the chapters, and you can get a free download of chapter one, go to practiceofinclusion.com, and there's links for all that over there. Okay? Um, so uh, what do I want to do today, uh, or tonight, uh, I want to talk about more about these concepts and how we're moving in some ways from talking about diversity to diversity and inclusion uh, in particular. In fact, some companies are now talking about inclusion and diversity. I'll be presenting uh, next month at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion in Minneapolis, which, by the way, just changed its name from 24 or 25 years of being the Multicultural Forum on Workplace Diversity and is now calling itself the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. And Barbara, Dean, and I will be sharing the stage for one of the plenaries with um, the president of a, one of the business units of Cargill, where they've moved to talking about inclusion and diversity. And they have a rationale for that, and that's what we'll be talking about. Basically, the idea is that should come first. So maybe this is already out of date. Um, so I want to spend a lot of time talking about the concept of inclusion involving you in it. It'll be somewhat interactive. And uh, depending on time, I'll be talking about some research on assessing inclusion, some research I've done in both uh, with my students at Alliant, with some colleagues elsewhere, and then some applications in, with a consulting client, uh, some work I'll be presenting at SIOP in a couple of months. And hopefully, and, and the idea is to have some time for some dialogue and questions and so on. Okay? Does that sound like what you may have, maybe you came for? Or do you need, should we do something different? Is that good? All right, if you think of something else, let me know. Um, if you have questions, comments, anytime. Um, so I have more material than I can cover before 6 o'clock. Some of the research, for example, maybe we'll address in the, with the people who, who stay, for example. Okay, so just so you know, and I handed out the material um, so you'll know kind of where I am in the past, okay? Um, so I was going to ask who's here, and you already took care of that for me. Did anybody want to add anything about themselves that didn't get, didn't get covered by the rank, name, and serial number part? <laughs> I, you know, I'd like to do longer introductions in workshops and in my classes. Um, but I think it's, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but I think it's important when we, we meet to create a space for people to arrive and to know each other and to see each other and to hear each other. So if I, it's especially for those of you in OD, but I think this applies to everyone, it's important to think about how you create a space for people to connect and know each other and establish human contact. And introductions are a part of that, you know, and too often they're just routine where nobody's even really hearing much. So sometimes you have to think about, well, what's another question you can ask that kind of changes things a little bit? Like in my classes, when we start out the semester, I ask people to talk about the typical things, or I say, tell us 
you know, tell us an interesting story about your name, if you like. Or, and that leads to very interesting conversations. Or it might be, um, tell us, tell everybody something that's new for everyone here. Not new about you, but new for them. Just kind of signifying that we're creating a whole new configuration in that moment, even if the people already knew each other. Some of the things I'll be asking you, it's surprising how I bring these to people who have worked together for years, and they've never talked about some of these things. So, a lot of this work is about getting people to kind of see each other in some different ways and not be so familiar to each other, as if they can finish each other's sentences. Um, so, what about me? Who am I? I wanted to spend a couple of minutes telling you about me. Um, so, first of all, I was born close to the top of the world in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, nobody laughs. Whenever I do this with students, nobody laughs at the same image. Why is that? <laughs> it would, with executives, they always laugh, right? Especially when I do it in conflict workshops. Anyway, um, do you think is Buenos Aires at the top of the world or not? That's how the map should be. It's the other one. It should. It shouldn't it should be, be, there. be like that. It should be like that. Yeah. I don't know. That's how many. How many constructions do? How many maps do we carry on in our mind about how things are? in reality, and there really are construction, right? And maps are certainly like that, right? Um, anyway, I was born there, I'm turning 55 in, uh, in, a, in a month. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm 70? I mean, come on. <laughs> 42, okay, I'll take that. Uh, 38. Um, I was born in Buenos Aires, left uh, there and moved to Nueva York when I was uh, seven where I quickly had to learn the Queen's English. That's Queen's New York. Uh, so I kind of went through the sink or swim approach in the New York City public schools in 1966. Um, then uh, lived there for about four and a half years, and then we moved to Puerto Rico, where I had to learn a new kind of Spanish and a new kind of English, right? Because the kids in my uh, school, it was an English-speaking school, they didn't particularly like my... Uh, Long Island inflected English, and I was assimilating once again. Um, I learned to dance merengue, since merengue and salsa in Puerto Rico, so um, at bar mitzvahs. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got married, I didn't think it was a Jewish wedding without salsa and merengue. Right? Um, so uh, couldn't wait to get out of the island, although my family still lives there. I mean, my mother lives there, I have a, a brother who's there with his family. Uh, left and uh, got my um, undergraduate degree at Princeton University where I focused on so experimental social psychology. Uh, worked with some great psychologists, you know, like Ned Jones and was my senior advisor. I got John Darley was a mentor and Nancy Cantor and um, Joel Cooper. Anyway, you may know some of these names, maybe not, but well-known people in social psych. Really privileged to work with them. Um, and then for graduate school, I went to uh, New Haven. I studied at Yale University, kind of went out and there people did field studies. So it was like a, you know, kind of out in the real world. But it was still social psych. I also did uh, classes in organizational uh, behavior, organizational psychology at the Yale School of Organization Management, as it was known at the time. Now it's just the Yale School of Management. And so I got to study organizational diagnosis and uh, group dynamics and, and things of that nature. Uh, with people like Clay Alderfer and David Berg, so that was a big influence for me still to this day. Um, David Thomas was a, Robin Ely, they were like classmates in some of my classes. Um, you're probably reading some of their work in, in your diversity class. So kind of a cool time at Yale to be learning these things. Peter Salovey, who's now the president of Yale, was my office mate. Um, so it was, it was kind of a cool time, you know, and it's nice to have those connections now. Uh, but I left there um, and went to uh, State University of New York at Albany where I taught for seven years in psychology and Latin American and Caribbean studies. So I was doing interdisciplinary things. I was teaching courses not just in psychology, in IO psychology, but also in uh, things like the social psychology of ethnic groups or ethnic relations, courses on diversity and equity in America, interdisciplinary courses, things like that. And then uh, I came to San Diego down the road in 1993 and uh, essentially unpacked. That's the place I've lived the longest now in my life, for, um, going on 21 years. And I lived there with my wife, Andrea, who's also from Buenos Aires. She came when she was older. Um, and uh, we have three kids. I have a little bit more about kind of the different
the things I do. Um, just to kind of, because I do a lot of work on identity. I'm very interested in, for a long time I've been interested in our complex, the complexity of our identities, our multiple identities. And one of the themes in my work throughout my career, starting in graduate school, is the idea of that there's, yes, there's between group differences, like the cross-cultural things that we learn about and we stress so much at Alliant. Uh, but there's also within group diversity. And so I've tried to think about that, write about it, and really think about how do we take both into account without denying or ignoring either. And so, for example, over time, I've developed with a colleague, Vasca Gallegos, a, a model of Latino and Latina ethno-racial identity orientations, where we kind of look at diversity among Latinos and Latinas, but try to organize it in terms of how do we think Latinos and Latinas deal with the dominant uh, racial system in the United States. Kind of like the uh, Janet Helms' theory of racial identity or others like that, but oriented towards Latino and Latina realities and history and so on. Um, so, so I have all these different things I'm interested in, and, and then they get fed into by the different roles and activities I have. And some of those shift over time in, in how highlighted they are, or you know, some of them didn't exist at one point and then came in, like being a husband or a father and so on. Um, and what they mean can change. So when my mother had um, cancer or, uh, last year, you know, I spent part of the summer in New York just, you know, while she was getting treated. You know, it's just, you know, these things kind of take a different role. Being a son-in-law last, um, actually she had, it was two years ago, last year my father-in-law had lymphoma and was living with us, you know, with my mother-in-law for six months. So being a son-in-law was even, you know, bigger than it usually is. So, but the point is also that all these things connect to each other and give each other meaning. And so I do a lot of work on identity in this way. One of the chapters in the book goes into this in a lot more detail as well. Uh, but I'd like to share about myself as an example. You know, it's, if you just talk about this stuff in theory, it doesn't make as much sense. If you're going to be a consultant, if you're going to work with people on these issues, you have to be ready to expose yourself a little bit in a way that feels authentic to you. This is what um, Ella Bell had to say about this and about leaders more generally. She wrote a great book called um, Career GPS, Strategies for Women Navigating the New Corporate Landscape. It came out a couple years ago. I think it's a good book, not just for women, and not just for those navigating the corporate landscape. She just has a lot of great ideas. And she says, in order to succeed, you have to bring your whole self to the table. The higher you ascend, the more important it is to be authentic and comfortable with yourself. The finest, most accomplished, most effective leaders don't hide who they really are. In fact, the best leaders generally have a great deal of self-awareness and have learned from the experiences that shape their lives and enable them to move ahead. I find that really, really powerful, um, how she speaks to the idea that it's not a weakness or a deficiency if you are authentic and you really think about who you are and how you got there. The key to that is being authentic and being self-aware. And what does it mean to be authentic? It means being grounded in one's own life path. It doesn't mean we're fully formed. We're still growing and developing, right? A lot of times we talk about being who you are, and we're gonna, I'm going to keep that theme on the table for a little while. Uh, but to me, it's not about letting it all hang out or violating one's privacy. It's about being clear about who we are, how we can feel whole, including when we're at work, rather than split off from some part of ourselves. Right? It's not about what we're coming out with all the time or just telling people funny or exotic stories. It's about feeling whole and integrated and being comfortable in one's own skin. And therefore, being willing and able to become one's own best self and not somebody else's idea of what we're supposed to be or who we're supposed to become. Does that resonate for you? So, um, so that's the context in which I think about um, some of these issues. Um, another part of it, it's not just about, um, there's another important reason for being ourselves. It's not just for success in one's career or for being an effective leader. It's about really making a difference in the world in a way that, that connects to our values, to what's important to us, uh, to what matters for us. And um, you know who that is? Yeah. Martin Luther King. Yeah, Martin Luther King. Yeah, so Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, Dr. King, who is somebody I really admire, particularly a lot of the things he did but, and also the things he said. And if you haven't looked at some of his work, like the letter from Birmingham Jail, go home and read it. It's really an American, it's a, it's a really important document in, in U.S. history, in world history. 
uh, in terms of the, the message that he's conveying about leadership, about speaking up, about using one's voice, about connecting to, and dealing with differences and injustice. Um, so that's a topic for another talk, but uh, one of the things that he says that really drives my, me in a lot of ways is this. He said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. That's very powerful. Think about that. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. So it's important then to know, if, you, if, if that makes any sense to you, you have to know what matters. <laughs> And, and what you're going to do about it, just so you can really get in touch with your own vitality and, and be fully in the world while you're here. We're all here only for a certain amount of time, so what are we going to do about that, right? What are we going to do with that? Now, I'm just as, like anybody, you know, I don't claim any special privilege in, you know, making, you know, not wasting time or any of that stuff. I waste plenty of time, so it's not about that, but it's about really in certain situations, being clear about what being able to take a stand or being able to speak to injustice, right? So when I think about inclusion, and I don't think about it in terms of, hey, let's make everybody comfortable all the time. In fact, again, this is also a whole other talk, but inclusion can sometimes be pretty uncomfortable. What I like to say is about spreading the discomfort around a bit more equitably. Right? Some people have been very comfortable and some people are less comfortable. And so how do we make that a little bit, you know, how do we jumble it up so we're all more comfortable and we're all a little bit more equitably uncomfortable or equally uncomfortable? So, it, that's the context in which I, I do this work. And so I know I take a long time to kind of set things up, but to me that's the most important stuff. You know, it's the, what could, passes the setup in the talk, but I don't tell you anything else. That's the stuff I really care about. Um, now to the sort of the, the diversity and diversity to inclusion. What do we mean by diversity, right? Some of you have been looking at this in your course. Some of you already maybe took that course. Um, maybe you know this already. So I'm going to go kind of quickly. But um, the idea is that diversity is more than numbers, first of all, right? And then what is it? And I like there's many different ways to capture it. Um, some of you are reading more Barak's book. He lists a whole bunch of different definitions and the ways you can categorize a definition. So you'll become experts on that. But I like um, David Thomas and Robin Ely's um, sentence because it captures a lot. They said diversity is the varied uh, perspectives and approaches to work that members of different identity groups bring. Or at least diversity in the workplace, right? So what's important about this is that there's the, the identity, some of the things I talked about earlier in relation to me, and it's what that represents. It's not just, that, it's not just a, a, a label. It's that those carry with them certain significance in terms of different histories, different values, different perspective on life. You know, culture is one part of that. Right? So we come together, like I showed you all my different roles and activities, right? Each of those has with it particular, and especially in the configuration of those, I'm going to be different as a community, in my community involvement because of my ethnic and, and, and family roles and my professional roles and all that than somebody else I'm working with, and vice versa, right? So we're coming together in workplaces, bringing all kinds of stuff with us that is related to those identities and experiences. Right? So that's the diversity. That's just a fact. That's, you go to any human group, and I think you're going to have diversity, right? So then the question is, what do we do about that? Um, but the first question I want to ask you is, why is it important? I mean. Why, is there, why are we talking so much about diversity? First of all, um, <coughs> it's the right and just thing to do, to, 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 uh, to create and encourage diversity. And plus discrimination is illegal in, 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 in this country, at least along certain dimensions, and it's wrong, right? So it's kind of like the moral argument, right? Um, and mixed in with the legal argument sometimes, or, or which comes first depends on how you look at it, right? Or if you, sometimes you can separate them. Uh, I mean, it's, this is still controversial for a lot of people. I mean, just look at the whole hoopla about some of the stuff that's going on in the last two weeks. You know, the Coca-Cola ad the, uh, mm -hmm. and during the Olympics, uh, during the uh, Super Bowl, the uh, Cheerios ad during the Super Bowl, or the, uh, you know, NFL player, a uh, professional NFL player says he, he's uh, gay, and that seems to be a big deal, you know. Um, so, you know, we're still deliberating a lot of these issues, even at this level. Um, Another argument is that we need to represent the community. Um, 
for various reasons. One is, again, because it's right, or we need the other reason, maybe because maybe we're going to do better business that way. Right? I mean, how can you do any business in France if you don't know people who, people who don't know anything about France or represent France? As uh, Thomas Danilli pointed out, that can be limited because then people get put into niches, right? And they're seen as only doing that. So that's potentially problematic. Uh, but at least it helps you acknowledge the differences. The first argument, if you focus on that only, then we kind of suppress differences and you lead to a whole ideology of like color blindness and ignoring group memberships and things like that that has its own pitfalls. Um, and other arguments are about the work itself, right? It's about the idea, well, if we look at diversity, it's going to really make us better. And usually you see a mix of all of these. Like if we get more diversity, we're going to get more ideas, more perspectives, right? I mean, the world is like that, right? Biology is like that. Um, Scott Page has a book about diversity. He's not an organizational person at all, but he's looking at biology and mathematics and, you know, philosophy and saying, look, we just, it's just better for, for human survival, for species survival. Um, and there's more, there's supposedly going to be more innovation and more creativity. So that's also better for business, especially at a time of change. You can't just keep doing things all the same, right? And supposedly we're going to get better results. If you have more ideas and more possibilities, we're going to be better able to to perform, right? So those are some of the arguments. Unfortunately, it does. if you look at the research, like a lot of researchers ask questions like, is diversity good or bad? Yes. <laughs> There's some negative things that happen when you have diversity if you don't handle it right. So it's really about how you address it. So that's what the asterisk is about. It can make us better under the right conditions. So we've talked about some other reasons. Um, but here's the issue of what we do with the diversity that I brought up in introducing this, right? What do we, what do we, that's the important issue. How, that's the challenge of inclusion. How do we actually connect with, engage with, use, and benefit from people across all these different types of differences? And that's the, the framing, in a sense, for, for this whole idea of inclusion. Okay. Um, so how do we move then? Why, why is it important to move from diversity to inclusion? First of all, I think... The inclusion concept helps us go, or, or to, I'm not eliminating diversity, I'm just saying diversity to inclusion and diversity. And inclusion goes well beyond representation for some of the reasons I've been talking about. It's not just about numbers anymore, right? It's about the processes, for example. How are we to get, how are we going to be together? You know, you're just not counting people in particular groups. We need to do that if we're going to overcome historical inequities, for example, right? So, but that's not enough. That doesn't assure us of anything in terms of people feeling like they can really contribute, organizations getting the benefit, avoiding the negative consequences, potential negative consequences. Just the people sitting there by itself doesn't make that happen. There's issues of power, obviously. Uh, entitlement, history, and so on. Intergroup relations. Um, the other thing is from an inclusion perspective, diversity is a resource. So we see it as a positive thing. So we say, oh good, let's, let's get diversity. We're not automatically assuming, oh, we're all going to divide into tribes and we're going to be have color wars no matter what. <laughs> we're going to, uh, any of you go to summer camp where you have a color war, right? You divide people into groups and just create havoc for a few days. Um, from, this, from an inclusion perspective, we see diversity as a resource and it's good for us. Uh, again, depending on how we handle it. Um, the other thing I like about inclusion is that we see diversity as involving these many different dimensions of diversity. Right? We, we're not any one thing. Right? We can be many things at once. And to me, that feels more, gives me more power to be integrated and, and, and authentic. Um, and also, it allows everybody to be part of the process. It's not about quote-unquote protected groups. Everybody can contribute and should contribute. Everybody should have a voice. Everybody can be connected um, and belong. And we can do that and maintain our distinctiveness from others. Right? Have both of these opposing things be true at once. So you have to be willing to live with paradox to, uh, to work with inclusion or to create inclusion or to practice inclusion. Um, and the other thing I think, and this is what I'm going to get into a little bit, it, it, inclusion can apply at many different levels of analysis. It includes at the individual level, the interpersonal level, it applies to groups. And you can think about inclusion in larger systems as well. So I think it's, it's very useful from that perspective. And it's very much in line with what we see in psychology and in organizational studies and organizational behavior more generally, a positive, proactive kind of approaches are, are gaining a lot of traction and, and people are finding them very useful 
and very compelling. Right? The, the, like if you think about um, in positive psychology, right, building up people's strengths, the idea of resilience, the idea of um, um, all, all these uh, positive approaches in organizational studies, the same thing, right? Positive organizational studies, appreciative inquiry, for example, in organizational development is one of the early examples of such an approach, right? Make sense? So um, this is a vision of inclusion from the marketing world, but I really like it. You can't read the little text, I'll tell you what it says, but this is an ad that was in Diversity Inc. magazine a few years ago. Uh, and I really like it. It kind of captures a lot. This is a vision of inclusion from Pricewaterhouse Coopers. And what they say is, when you left for work this morning, what did you leave behind? Your opinions? Your background? Your earring? Your native language? Your doubts? Your children? Your secrets? Your real hairstyle? <laughs> your race? Your politics? Your ethnicity? Your gender? Your sexual orientation? Your personality? <laughs> your uniqueness, your ideas, yourself. A workplace can only be diverse if the people who work there can be themselves. So it captures a lot, huh? The, the hairstyle thing is funny, see, because we don't think about that so much when we think about diversity, right? But when we talk about it, when it comes up, it's like, oh yeah. It is connected to dimensions of diversity, number one. And number two, and to power, and to all kinds of other things, right? And it represents a lot of issues. Like, I don't have to think much when I get dressed in the morning, I take a shower, I put on my clothes, and I leave, right? Other people that I might work with might spend a lot of time having to deal with stuff that they think they need to deal with, whether society imposes or both, right? So is that fair? Is that what we should be doing? Do we account for that in some way? Do we add that to people's work time? You know, We don't have these conversations, right? We just assume everybody should be treated the same, you know? But then some people end up suppressing things and other people don't. So that's the unequal discomfort that I was talking about earlier, right? I mean, if you laugh, it's because maybe you connect to that, right? This, so then the question is, what do we do about it? Right? And I've, I've alluded to this, this idea of bringing your whole self to work. Right? We hear that. I do a lot of workshops on this. I've been talking about this, working on this for many years. So what does that mean? Why does it matter? And how does it connect to, to wholeness, to effectiveness, to productivity at work? I do workshops focus primarily on this. For example, I work with the... Uh, Latino Leaders Program at Wells Fargo for many years, and one of, the, in addition to a whole session focused on finding one's voice in conflict and pushback, I do a whole session on bringing the whole self to work, and we work with people for a couple of hours on this concept, and what I ask people to do is do some identity mapping. In my classes, I do this a lot as well. We don't have time for that now, but um, I encourage you to think about what, what are your, the different things that make you, you? Who are you? What are the different components or, or dimensions of difference and similarity that make you who you are. What are not, just on your, not just at the individual level in terms of personality or individual features, but in terms of some of the identities that you got simply by who, what family you were born into and what group that family is part of. And, you know, uh, like I'm a, in middle age now and I never chose that, right? So I'm <laughs> thankful for that, right? I want to, you know, every birthday I say, great, you know, I want another one, you know? Um, um, but, um, you know, it's just, we have many identities that are, in a sense, um, given to us. Uh, and then we have others that we choose, uh, you know, becoming a, a graduate student, for example, or a, a faculty member or whatever. We acquire certain identities over time. Uh, maybe you could put age like that, if you will. Um, and we have other identities that maybe feel like they're external, but that's how people see us. Anyway, this is just one way to categorize things. You can do it in terms of, I do it also in terms of social identities more generally. Um, but the point is to make a map where you're not making pieces of the pie, but rather, I guess some of you are using Taylor Cox's book, and I have a thing with his little pie chart. You know, I like to put it all into one thing because they all relate to each other. Um, and to think about what makes you who you are. You know, how do, what, how do you give meaning to those identities, right? Because you have your particular meaning for those and the way they intersect with each other and affect each other. Um, and then there's some things about you that are important to you, but you may not share or be clear about or connected to at work. So I ask people to, 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 to connect with that and think about that and work with that and share with each other. Um, this is a model I share with them as well. Uh, which I think is relevant to this issue of why it's important. Um, this is from Bowen and Blackman, and you have the, the reference in 
they talk about vertical spirals of silence in it. They're, the examples they use have to do mostly with sexual orientation, but I love that because it's, you know, it's a choice we all make about do we come out as whatever we are. Like with the Latinos they talk about, like, do we come out as Hispanic at work, you know, or Latino? Right? And we're making choices about that in different situations. And so for many of us, it's a question, do we come out as whatever, right? Did I tell you about that I learned fast and meeting at bar mitzvahs? Do I want to identify myself, you know, knowing that those stereotypes that he talked about are out there? Do I label myself as Jewish, right, in the first, you know, half a minute of my talk, right? So we make choices about these things. And it's a kind of coming out. So, um, so this model suggests that if we're not free to talk about who we are at work, if we're like in that place that your, uh, your friend was at, right, who tried to fight against it, um, but we're repressing things about who we are, so we're having conflicts between our identity at work and our identities outside, and we're putting a lot of emotional energy on keeping things secret. And so we're going to experience more stress on the job, and we're going to have less commitment to that organization. And, and if we're not free to talk about who we are, it means we can't share as much of our life with coworkers, which means that our interactions, our social interactions, are not going to be as natural, they're going to be more inhibited, they're not going to be as, 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 as easy. And so we're going to have less social exchange with the people around us, which, by the way, is very important at work. Most of the research shows a lot of, we spend a lot of our waking lives at work, or at least a lot of people do. And um, so we're going to be less satisfied with the job if we're not having those kind of social connections. And if we can't share our life with coworkers, then we're not going to fully engage in our work. And so we're going to have fewer casual conversations. We're going to be more in a little area. So we're going to talk less about task-related things. And so we're going to have more ambiguity about what are we trying to do there. And so then, if we can't fully engage in work, then maybe we can't speak as credibly about important issues at work, which means we're going to have less organizational voice, where that's going to be repressed. So this is not about those, um, what do you call them, like, um, you know, costume days or, you know, like potluck dinners and, you know, let's go out and, sh you know, wear our national costume and share our actual dish things, right? That's kind of fun, but this doesn't address any of this. In fact, it probably represses it more, because later it says, okay, we had our fun, now let's go back to our normal ways of being, right? And we never explore, like, how did those come about, and how do they privilege some groups over others? So some people have to spend that hour in the morning fixing their hair, and other people don't, right? You see how it's, it's all connected, right? But we don't do that, we don't talk about that so much. So, um... Okay, so let's get to inclusion then. So what's inclusion, right? As we move uh, towards that, how do we conceptualize inclusion? Um, okay, so in this context then, I think about inclusion as being how much, and again, I said there's many different definitions, and if you looked at the book, you'll see it has six pages of many different people's words about what it is. My way of capturing it, all, a lot of it is, is this way. But again, I don't want to privilege this over the other ones. You take it as you will, but I think it's, how much people of all group identities, whether visible or not, can feel safe, appreciated, valued, and able to be authentic at work. And I, I translate that further to a psychological experience of inclusion. And as you'll see in a little bit, I think about inclusion having many different facets or ways of looking at it. It's almost like a prism. And so at the individual level, you can think about the individual sense of being included. I, we call that the, I call that the experience of inclusion. And I w would use that as a criterion as to whether inclusion is happening or not, right? I can do all the behaviors I think are inclusive to you, but if you're not feeling included, then I don't think we're having inclusion, right? I mean, we can explore why that might be. Maybe there's some issue there in terms of, like, your contact with humanity, right? Maybe, right? But still, that interaction isn't working, and we've got to work it, we've got to figure it out, right? doesn't mean that the behaviors aren't inclusive in a general sense or wouldn't work with someone else or with other people. But in, if you're not feeling included in those interactions, then we don't have inclusion. Would, does that make sense to you? Because that's kind of the core of the way I approach this. And so inclusion, experience of inclusion is how much the individual feels that way. Safe, trusted, accepted, all these good things, right? Respected, supported, valued, fulfilled. Do you want to feel that way at work? Is that a good thing? Would you prefer being in places that have more of this rather than not, where you can feel engaged and authentic at work? Yes? You're not convinced? Yes. 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 All right. Yeah, and I think it's not just about as individuals, but it's also do we feel that way as members of those identity groups that are important to us, right? 
Because, you know, I could say, yeah, I really feel like I'm one of the boys, right, at this organization. Yeah, but if you're not a boy, then maybe that doesn't feel so good, right? Well, that could be for a girl. Maybe one of the boys doesn't feel like one of the boys. It doesn't matter, right? But this idea of, right, of feeling like one of everybody, or the same as everyone, like maybe, yeah, they treat me really nice, as long as I'm like them, right? That's not inclusive. So that's my that's the point about being, as a, and it's multiple identity groups because I can be in a group where everybody's like me on some dimension, but not others. So how do we bring all the all of those, especially the ones that are important to us? Um, so if you turn this, I mean, you asked the question, Cynthia, which I think is really important. What's the context in which this occurs, right? How do we create that experience? And so there's different frameworks and models. There's many different models of organizations, um, you know, Mark has a good model of this, um, there's the, the, um, the one that um, uh, Thomas and Ely have a model of different paradigms, there's uh, uh, Miller and Katz have a path model, uh, a lot of them have a similar kind of idea, of, Taylor Cox has one in his, in his book, right, um, that similar ideas that organizations can move from being monocultural or exclusive homogeneous, right, where basically people are similar, right, the image tries to capture that, um, at least on the surface, right, um, and they have similar styles and that's what's valued and people are either kept out, who are different are kept out either actively or passively. Um, and then maybe we move to more transition organizations, plural, uh, some um, models called plural organizations, where we make active efforts perhaps or for, or for other reasons that things change. More people come in who are visibly different. But as I've tried to show with this image I picked, maybe the models of leadership and the styles tend to be the old ones, right? N not everything has changed. And then if we make further changes, maybe the organization can become more inclusive and more multicultural. And multicultural not just in the ethnic or you know, national sense, but in the sense of all the different uh, dimensions of difference that I, we were alluding to, right? Kind of in the Thomas and Ely sense that I talked about earlier. Um, and so now it's, you have all these different identities and many different configurations of power and of relationships, and, and, and the leadership is not as obvious necessarily in terms of like a certain model or a certain look to leadership, right? Or, or ways of doing things. So that's kind of a very schematic way. Those of you studying this are going to get into this in a lot more detail, and there's a lot of work out there on this. Um, but then bringing it back to inclusion, right? How do we, the idea is how do we move, what's happening in that inclusive organization, and how do we move there? How do we connect the different levels? And so this is a framework that I try to develop to capture some of that, and that's what I talk about a lot in the first chapter of uh, the book, is this idea of grounded in the experience of inclusion that we just had an ex a sense of a few minutes ago, and then saying, okay, individuals can have that, and you can also think about that collectively, like groups having that, right? Like the, maybe some groups feel more included than other groups, right? And then that relates to, um, that stems from what the values in the society, uh, and, well, the values, the policies, the practices, and the behaviors on the part of the society, in the organization, on the part of leaders, within the work group, and on the part of individuals, other individuals, and oneself. Those are the inclusive behaviors, practices, values, etc., right? And those can, ideally, help stimulate and create the experiences of inclusion. And I think this acts in a virtuous cycle in that experiences of inclusion also stimulate more inclusive behavior and more inclusive values. Right? Because maybe maybe by virtue of having had this conversation you had, maybe now you're going to go out and do something more inclusive for someone else or for yourself, right? So that's kind of the simple version of the idea. Does that make sense? Now things could moderate that relationship and all of that, but we're not going to get into that right now. Uh, and then I put it together in this kind of schematic way of thinking, well, what are the different levels and the systems of inclusion? Like, if you think about all of this being inclusion, you can break it apart, right? So it's almost like you can look at it at different levels, or you can look at the whole thing. And with, with the flow going both up and down, from the um, experience of inclusion at the individual level, uh, individuals can engage in inclusive interpersonal behavior for themselves in relation to others as well, 
things happen in groups and teams. You can look at like, what are the inclusive practices in groups and teams? What are the norms, for example? What are the collective experiences of inclusion? One of my doctoral students is doing his dissertation using a measure that I had developed earlier with other students uh, to assess the experience of inclusion and looking at it in, in groups and trying to relate that to group process variables. How much do people share information and how much conflict is there in the group? Because he, those are precursors to performance. And he, he's doing this in a Chilean uh, supermarket chain collecting data right now. Um, you can look at leaders and leadership and the practices that leaders do. I think of leaders as the, and leadership as the linchpin, kind of that drives things down and also relates to the uh, other parts of the organization. So that kind of affects, it's a leverage point really for whether things will take hold and, and keep happening or not, uh, or, or get blocked. And then you have the systemic kinds of things in the organization as a whole. When you think about organizational culture, like Lisa Nishi, for example, looks at inclusive organizational cultures, inclusive cultures. And that's what her chapter in the book is about. Uh, what are the policies, the practices, the climates, and what are some ways to make them more inclusive from being less inclusive? And finally, you can look at society as a whole. You can think about the ideologies in society, the policies, the practices, the values. And also, of course, how these things intersect across particular levels or multiple levels. Right? So there's a lot of questions and a lot of nuances. And so to me, all of this is inclusion. And the practice of inclusion is how we understand this, how we do it on a regular basis, how we integrate these different levels. And that, to me, is really truly putting diversity at work and putting diversity to work. So thanks to those of you in the OD class. If anybody else needs to leave, please.